Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to Network FX. I'm Brittany. I'm the moderator. And we have four really wonderful panelists today. We're going to be talking about emotions and bots and shit posting and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, first we have Jackie Feldman. She's a writer. She also works in artificial intelligence, composing dialogue for chatbots. And her essays about bots and other topics have appeared in Real Life Magazine, The White Review, as well as online at The New Yorker and The Paris Review. Thanks. So, I'm going to speak about AI and effective labor. What brings me to this intersection is a statistic I came across recently from a study uh, by the Institute for Spatial Economic Analysis at the University of Redlands. This is a, an article about it. Um, according to these researchers, women stand to lose their jobs at twice the rate of men due to AI-related automation. Uh, reading from this chart, women confront a 13.4% chance of automation taking over their jobs as compared with 5.8% for men. Many of these jobs to be lost involve effective labor, a service with a smile. Uh, and this statistic makes sense to me because I work with chatbots, which are supplanting customer service representatives. Um, and while I haven't managed to find really any corroborating statistics, my hope in airing this one to a room full of students of the social sciences is that maybe someday someone will replicate it. Okay, so think about it. Um, and I think a lot of people just came in. I hope that they'll feel free to take seats if they want there a lot. Um, okay, so despite our familiarity with chatbots, in other ways this prediction contradicts much of what we've been told about automation. Um, as I recently wrote for Garage, the myth of job loss due to technological acceleration is in America one of men, of auto plants, and Bruce Springsteen's protagonists. Um, the New Yorker feature, who've, whose headline I've reproduced here, is complicit, I think, in this myth, selecting the suffering of a group of men as its exemplar of an AI-related casualty. They work at an auto parts factory, which is implementing robots. I will note that not all robots are AI. So this statistic surprises us not only because of our national concern for men, but also because of a widely held idea that the ways in which we set fellow humans at ease are rarefied. Charm is a human specialty. In her, as I've written elsewhere, Theodore Twombly composes messages for beautifulhandwrittenletters.com, and given the endlessly interesting conversation on offer from his virtual assistant, Samantha, it is remarkable, I think, that his job, at least the composition part, has not been automated. So the notion that only humans can perform affective labor adequately reminds me of the mystification of women's work that Silvia Federici describes in Wages Against Housework, her 1975 essay. She writes, not only has housework been imposed on women, but it has been transformed into a natural attribute of our female uh, phys physique and personality, an internal need and aspiration supposedly coming from the depth of our female character. Housework had to be transformed into a natural attribute rather than be recognized as a social contract because from the beginning of Capital's scheme for women, this work was destined to be unwaged. So there is the idea that women are uniquely suited to emotional labor as well as domestic work for their grace and forbearance. And then there's an idea that people of color are fit for service work because of some inherent quality, like what the scholar Sien Nagai describes as a racialized animatedness. So mystifications like these have been, to say the least, unhelpful. They contribute to the pernicious idea that effective labor ought to be seized or freely given. I'd like to ask whether there is anything liberating in, conversely, understanding this labor as so intelligible its elements can be taught to a bot. This brings me to two questions which I ask experimentally. I don't really plan to answer them, but maybe you can. Um, so recognizing that the situation of bots hardly rivals that of women or of other service workers, can the revelation that bots carry out effective labor contribute at all to the demystification that Federici calls for? Is it, in fact, simple to fake the requisite affect, even for a bot? So at this point, I should explain my job. Um, for two years, I've intermittently worked for technology companies as what's called a conversation designer, an interaction designer, or an AI UX designer. I compose the dialogue for chatbots. Um, this is an excerpt from a short piece I wrote for NewYorker.com about my work. It's a dialogue with a bot. Uh, that I was scripting named Kai. Um, so 
The gender ratio among engineers in AI is still more skewed than in the tech sector at large, and my work is distinctly feminized. My labor consists in feelings. I set, I set at ease users of the AI system with messages that cause the bot to appear approachable. When I email clients who appear to have a sense of humor, I find myself quoting in sign-offs the bot that I am scripting. If there's anything else, I say, let me know. Um, so, if bots have any affinity for effective labor, this is in part our fault for anthropomorphizing them so readily. Um, according to an experiment documented in 2016 in the Journal of the ACM, an official journal of the Association for Computing Machinery, researchers convincingly assigned several personalities to sofa bots, as they called them, which scooted about idiosyncratically. The personalities were varied. The authors write, the risk taker sofa bot was metaphorically described as a poker player who hides its intentions but is trembling to act on opportunities. The loving parent sofa bot, the authors go on, at the beginning was described as ready to help. Participants interacting with it described it as follows. It was helping me reorganize the room. I didn't feel alone. It was following me and it agreed with what I was doing. It observed me. Here, Ellen Ullman, after obtaining a toy robot, questions whether her cat is any more complex. I looked down at Sadie, she writes. Suddenly, I could not help wondering if all this asking for and getting attention this purring wasn't just like the hardwired program in the plastic robot. Was she nothing more than a mechanism, a cheap little program, an empty zombie? I looked into her eyes and I asked aloud, are you just a trick? Over the course of her essay, however, Ellman comes to understand why she prefers her cat to a robot. It is a compelling argument, and while I don't have a cat myself, I would not trade even my roommate's cat, let alone a friend of mine, for a companion robot. However, I think it is interesting to wonder whether there are specific small tasks, chores of attention, for which a bot might reasonably replace a human. I've been researching an early chatbot called Eliza, which was developed in the 1960s by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT. I spoke about Eliza in my presentation last year, too. It was, to recapitulate, a program that mimicked a Rogerian therapist, the kind who draws you out by parroting what you say. It switched around pronouns according to templates, making questions out of statements. Um, uh, so, for example, the user says, he says, I'm depressed much of the time. I am sorry to hear you are depressed. Um, you begin to see how this could be a very simple template where when the user says, I am something, and maybe it's negative, the bot says, I'm sorry to hear you are that. Um, in doing this, Eliza was astonishingly successful and persuasive. So this quotation comes from Weizenbaum's original 1966 paper explaining the project. He explains that the therapeutic dialogue takes the pressure off one participant because the patient will accept just anything as the cue to carry on talking about themselves. <laughs> So Weizenbaum writes, if, for example, one were to tell a psychiatrist, I went for a long boat ride, and he responded, tell me about boats, one would not assume that he knew nothing about boats, but that he had some purpose in so directing the subsequent conversation. This characteristic of the therapeutic dialogue made it, for Weizenbaum, a good example to try and reproduce with a bot. Eliza still lives in corners of the internet, and it seems we are experiencing something of a renaissance of therapy bots. I've taken this collage of headlines from articles this year and last year. That subhead at the top um, about a new category of prescription medical treatments accompanied a feature in the New York Times about non-bot apps that are prescription only, like the one put out by a company called Pair Therapeutics. Maybe they're running out of names, but I do like Wobot. Um, <laughs> of course, no one knows how well these work, and not even the people using them. So here I've excerpted from a conversation between Chris Krause and Leslie Jameson at the Paris Review's website. Uh, Jameson is speaking about a new book of hers called The Recovering, in which she, I haven't read it, she deals with, she says in this interview, um, the cliches that are present in 12-step programs, which have helped her. She's a recovering alcoholic. Um, she says to Krauss, I struggled with those cliches at first, but it came down to shifting away from the belief that speaking always had to constitute an act of self-expression and toward seeing speaking as a means of connection. How can these words, may be familiar, may be trite, serve as a bridge between our very different lives? 
At an industry conference last year, I spoke with a woman who planned a bot that would help in recovery from addiction, which can entail, as Jameson notes, rote steps. We typically associate this rote quality with replicability by a machine. Recently, a friend shared a, via Google Drive a trove of documents about a mediation technique called nonviolent communication, maybe trying to tell me something. It is a technique whose usefulness in calming dis discussants resides in its very scriptedness. So this reassurance, which I've translated, came from a friend of mine in Paris to whom I was complaining about my paid work. Personally, she wrote, I don't object to a shrink app that might prompt me daily not to drink too much or give up hope in certain moments to manage my violence. That's got to exist, but I don't even have an iPhone. In the meantime, we get along by our own methods. I was moved by my friend's thoughtfulness and simplicity. So supposing that bots can perform effective labor, I see several options for a conclusion. Uh, per my friend, is there anything hopeful in all this? When I moved from Paris to New York, I found the language of emotional labor was everywhere in Brooklyn, like the language of astrology. There was a great pressure in America to render everything billable. Occasionally, I worried that this cast human interaction as depleting. Maybe, as, in, we, as individuals, we can learn from the bot and its rote reassurances. Lately, I think about bots in connection with my grandmother, who turned 90 a week ago. With her, I spend my time answering small questions she asks repetitively. Alternatively, returning to Federici, do bots offer us any possibility for demystifying effective labor? A problem in crediting bots with this demystification is that they have much more time than we do. Because they perform tasks almost instantly and do not suffer, they are immaculately exploitable. Um, and I haven't spoken about the effective labor hidden within AI systems, that of poorly compensated AI trainers and workers contracted through Amazon's Mechanical Turk service to help the bot tell right from wrong. Are we only pawning off our sacred duty of keeping each other company on lifeless robots? Um, so uh, I have to end with a, can I end with two sentences? I have to end, with, thank you. I have to end with a caveat. Um, so we must remember that in interacting with, for example, Siri, we are actually interacting with Apple. The most pressing concern about our attachment to a bot is with what it compels us to buy or to buy into. But my job has caused me to consider the other option for human bot interacting relationships. I have come to find it interesting, even if it may be finally doomed. OK, thanks. Aaron Gordon is an MFA candidate in the Critical and Curatorial Study Program at the University of California, Irvine. And her research currently focuses on institutional curating and new media art. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to the conference organizers for having me again. Um, so my talk is called, Do You Want to Quit Intimacy, Sight, and Self? And um, I just wanted to add the addendum that this is a curatorial reflection on a project that I had been working on over the last um, eight months or so. Um, so in, in his book, My Tiny Life, Crime and Passion in a Virtual World, journalist Julian Dibble speaks to the specificity of the culture he lived within online in the 1990s. Your words are no longer merely what you have to say. They are your very presence. They're what manifests you in the virtual world. And how you use them consequently tends to shape that world's perceptions of you in much the same way how you look frames what the real world thinks. Consequently, this sentiment is very much shared today, although it might be more visually explicated than the text-based chat rooms of decades ago. The words we type, the actions we conduct online, uh, are how we are largely perceived in the real world. The coalescence of IRL, or RL as it was used in the um, MOOs, moves, multi-user dungeons with um, object-oriented techniques in the 90s, um, and an online existence is a thin boundary that was explored most notably by Dibble. Is there a clear distinction between IRL and RL in 2018? If I use the internet to search for artists' works, am I operating in IRL or RL or between the two? Um, curator Omar Khalif asks in the curator's new medium, could an institutional museum curator or art collector seriously construct a cross-referential historical survey by using Amazon's friendly recommended for you search function? The idea of using Amazon's algorithm within the art institution is semi-satirical, yet plausible in its late foreshadowing, I want to say. I often wonder if it is unavoidable to curate without a search engine's algorithm or the algorithm elicited by a string of RL encounters and meetings. And this is where I arrived months after planning, opening, and closing an exhibition for my thesis project at large. 
I collaborated with algorithms on the show, ultimately, I believe. But more specifically, I collaborated within the internet and the tendrils that comprise a network and its varied meanings, as well as the term affect and its varied meanings among scholars and theorists today. If I use an algorithm in any which way to curate a show, in this case, I use Google, is this forever a part of the curatorial experience, regardless of its content and included mediums? Is social media vis-a-vis -vis Web 2.0 an essential part of the curation of contemporary art now? And if so, what is left for me as a curator with interest in incorporating the internet and media works into future shows? Lastly, is, it a, is a physical art space that presents media works most accessible through feeling or affect? Although I'm positing the internet as a pedagogical tool as well as a collaborator, I find that the internet's facilitating of communication is what has been most compelling as an emerging curator who grew up during the emergence of Web 2.0. It is more than tactility, more than the interactive potential of the internet as a tool in curating. It is the ability to connect to something else that ultimately generated this exhibition subtitle, Intimacy Site and Self. I attempted to curate an exhibition based on personal and public affect with a very small budget, a very tiny budget, and a loose conceptual framework. So with the internet, I imagined an amalgamation of works in the space the exhibition would be in. In this case, it was at UC Irvine's University Art Gallery. Um, so I was working with the idea that bodies that deviate from cisgender um, and hegemonic masculinities have a larger barrier to overcome when engaging in the network, and very much this results in some kind of emotional or effective labor. Um, as a means of mediating oneself when internet or non-internet based community exhibits threatening behaviors against other identities. So this thesis manifested itself in the form of three interdisciplinary artists, um, Angela Washko, Hannah Quinlan, and Rosie Hastings, and Morshan Alayari, whose works play with the vocabulary of new media and the internet largely. Um, there were six works total, and Angela Washko, her um, game, The Game, The Game was in it, and the, this was recently at the Museum of the Moving Image, um, and her piece, Do Not Enter, Room 16 of the Panther Modern, um, which you can actually play online now. Um, and then I had Hannah Quinn and Ros Rosie Hastings, UK Gay Bar Directory from 2016. And um, there's another picture of it. And then Morishan Alayari, she who sees the unknown Huma in, in mere spaces, all things are side by side. Um, the installation and run of the show operated in a few ways I did not expect, and I believe that the exhibition is not properly activated until an audience has interaction with it. Um, so I once spent an absurd amount of time chatting with random people when I was younger um, th through their avatars on the legs. I used a lot of Neopets, Club Penguin, and I really loved the Doll Palace for some reason. Um, tying up my parents' phone line so I could connect to AOL for just an hour or two. As I inhabited each avatar's identity, I created another bridge to another identity online, even though I was very young and curious. Um, I collaborated with the internet on the show. Uh, going back to the original idea. And I think the internet will always be my main co-conspirator in the implementation of any kind of curatorial endeavor. And although many gallery shows come to fruition through friendly relationships or word of mouth these days, if I type in a few keywords into a search bar, I will find an interesting bit of information that will lead me to something else. Um, I do believe expanding on, on, upon the innovation of the network in the future especially causes its users to physically and emotionally manage themselves to continue to actively participate in the culture of the internet. And I felt, I've always felt this way, especially in these chat rooms. Um, in drawing together intimacy, sight, and the self, it is important to address these three concepts as a response to the network in terms of technology and the internet, but also the internet as a conceptual framework in the same way theorists like Alexander Galloway and Tiziana Terranova, among others, have discussed it. The red, blue, green, and yellow cables that line the interiors of Google's data centers make for a very picturesque scene, of course. The buildings often sit upon hillsides or near water with photographs taken at the apex of the sunset. These are some of the many possible physical elements of what constitute a network. The servers that fill those buildings are ultimately what we connect through when we connect to the internet. To move away from and back to the material example of the network is necessary in framing this exhibition, I believe, as well as the general function of the network as a way to transport data and the information between bodies. Um, in an infamous essay for Art Forum's 50th anniversary issue, um, scholar Claire Bishop posits, whatever happened to digital art? Despite the backlash that she received after her essay was published, 
this initial question that led into a succession of controversy is very much present in the world of contemporary art even today, six years later, um, which has institutions and galleries only dedicated to it and its postmodernity or lack thereof. Um, however, I do not feel that something has happened to digital art, but rather digital art has been off separated from the rest of the fine arts at large. Um, Shortly after her initial question, Bishop wondered why digital works have not thoroughly filtered affect through the digital. And with this remark, I firmly believe that she, every, a lot of people believe that she's very wrong with that. Um, artworks built with the technological fully utilize affect with the apparatus, and especially so in an institutional space. So using this text was a catalyst, although it is slightly dated. Um, generating this exhibition, this bizarre section of art historical scholarships unwillingness to engage with new media art in some ways, um, outside of the black box context especially. And in framing the research with, I with ideas of the network's relationship with community and social spaces as well as emotion itself, the management of emotion and considering digital games too as art within the whole sphere of contemporary art um, and reference Re referencing and reflecting upon my exhibition is integral to furthering it. Um, the nature of curating a gallery exhibition requires a huge amount of planning and forethought um, in generating the framework and the actual physical exhibition. And the process of communicating with artists before and during installation leaves little room for critical discourse aside the essay I drafted before the uh, um, exhibition was up. There are many pedagogical and technical texts on curating art today. Um, anyone can learn how to do it essentially, or you don't even have to read a book, but there are <laughs> countless volumes by uh, Hans Ulrich Oberst, of course. Um, there's the Adrian George's Curator's Handbook, and there's a curatorial toolkit by a Canadian-based curator, uh, Karen Love. Although I've admit admittedly skimmed these texts just to see what's going on, um, formulating the exhibition itself is largely done on my own uh, with additional assistance. Um, the essay I drafted for the show was speculative by its very nature, and it rested on the thesis that I had described above uh, about the network. Um, and it started initially just speaking back to games with an interest, especially in Angela Washko's work and her uh, with with the immaterially immateriality of the game space through her documented interactions with players on World of Warcraft. Um, the game space is a starting point for discussing an art space as a space alternative to our reality, um, which Mackenzie Wark, in his book Gamer Theory, um, positioned the atopia as an alternative to utopia and dystopia. Um, it is a placeless, senseless realm where quite a different maxim rules, from each according to their abilities um, to each a rank and score. And I wonder if his theories on gamification are ap applicable to cur contemporary curating or curating of this moment. And then, kind of skipping forward, um, curating is, as much as I would like to scoff at this, a form of taste making in some way. Uh, it is a vocation in which you don't have to get paid for to do it, and many of us don't. And if someone likes what you're doing, maybe you could actually get paid for it. Um, I once told a classroom of students that curating is not really anything to frame within a high art context anymore. You can do it on Steam, you can do it on Spotify, what have you. Um, and I just wanted to call back, skipping forward, there's some more installation shots. Um, just as an example, there's this exhibition called Hashtag Social Medium that opened at the Fry Art Museum in Seattle, Washington in 2014. Its tagline read, you are the curator. Um, the idea of the exhibition was, and it still is, a little provocative for an art museum, um, leaving the curating largely to anyone with a social media account. And so there's a lot of input from the audience, which is really interesting, especially with, um, new media and thinking of how that could be incorporated. And so I was really lucky actually, um, I TA'd for a class a few months ago in which, uh, this is not common, but the undergrads had to go to my exhibition for credit, <laughs> so extra credit. Um, so they had to post on this forum and I got over some really interesting responses. I'll just uh, read a couple of them, I'll skip over. Uh, so this is my favorite one, actually. Um, especially walking into this dark exhibit baffled me at first as I observed the pieces. 
um, happened to be projected presentations on the wall. As I made through the room absorbing the mystery of the atmosphere music, I strolled over to the game and all of a sudden felt like I was in another installation of a Saw film. Um, so even though I didn't intend to evoke creepy, it evoked something. I have a couple more sentences. Um, so forums like the aforementioned one present a real tangible possibility for a future where we curate our exhibitions with media. Um, it is a way of playing into this idea of collaborating with the algorithm as well as the likes, comments, what have you, in response to the collaboration and the very IRL feelings it evokes. Thank you. Amber Westerholm Smythe is a part time grad student at the Oxford Internet Institute and a user experience researcher at the Government Digital Service. Um, so, just a quick content warning I am slightly changing tact. I'm going to be talking about terrorism. So, if anyone has any personal um, sensitivities around that, now would be a really good time for you to leave the room. Um, it's not explicit, but I know that some people can experience emotional reactions. Um, okay, so I'm going to do something that most people don't do with presentations and start by telling you the end of the story. And my story ends with this statement. I think social media is conditioning our grief response to mass tragedy. It's going to take four questions to show you why I think this is happening and to allow you to weigh up your conclusions. And by the end, I'm really hoping that, like me, you think that this is something that is happening and you think it deserves academic attention and is possibly something that we should be quite concerned about. So let's begin. Is this really happening? On the evening of November the 13th, 2015, the worst terror attack to have taken place on European soil in eight years occurred. The terrorist group ISIS took 130 lives and left hundreds wounded after a series of senseless attacks across Paris. 89 of those were killed inside the Bataclan Concert Hall by three gunmen execution style. The next morning, as the news broke in the UK and brought the full truth of the atrocities, I posted this. This was not my normal Instagram style, but compelled to express something I had turned to social media. And my behavior, nor my post, was actually unique. Thousands of others shared content across Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And in fact, 70 million people shared the hashtag Pray for Paris. This behavior, as it turned out, wasn't even unique to Paris. Eight more large-scale terror attacks occurred in Europe between 2015 and 2018. All were unique in attack, location, and style, but every single one elicited eight homogenous reactions on social media, from Brussels to London to Nice to Manchester to Barcelona. This behavior is explicitly homogenous, which is unusual for such personal emotions such as grief. So it brought me to question, why is this happening? Social norms are the grammar of social interaction. They are defined as implicit or explicit rules that guide behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs within a certain group. From how we act in a lift to holding the door open for someone else, but as society moves its daily affairs into the digital, our virtual spaces, like any other social spaces, are becoming subject to norms and rules of conduct that impact the way people interact and act with each other online. In most social interactions, we have seen an expansion of offline behavior into online spaces. But grief is different. Not many of the offline norms associated with mass tragedy are easily replicated online. Minute silences, funerals, flowers are pretty hard to translate to the online space. Instead, the way people are dealing with death and loss online, and particularly on social media, are being curated by the technology itself through what's known as technological affordances. Technological affordances is a term used in academia used to describe what and how users can complete tasks within the technologies at their disposal. In essence, it highlights how behavior online is shaped by the tools that facilitate it. Things like retweets and likes, sharing, liking, following, they all determine a certain style of behavior. And social media has a lot of affordances. But whilst there might be a lot, their impact and influence online is extremely concentrated into three main platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And this is because of the role of network effects. Some services become more useful the more people use them. Facebook is valuable to users because there are other users you can be contacted through the site. The more that users a site has, the more useful it becomes. These services are defined by economists as displaying network effects and they're an implicit part of social media platforms. They are also the reason that we have seen an entrenchment of the power of these networks rather than a dilution by competitors. The opportunity cost for moving to a new platform is too high for the consumer, so we get a concentration of power. And with concentration comes not only a huge amount of influence over our social norms, but a desire to retain our attention. 
Platforms sustain their network effects by offering us technology for free in return for the ability to sell our attention. And attracting and maintaining that attention is not an easy business in an environment full of distractions, leading some platforms to turn to more innovative ways to keep our fingers and eyeballs online, as we will soon see. But at this point, you're probably saying, is this really new? So what, is it so bad that we have democratized social norms from the clutches of traditional institutions? And haven't social norms always been dictated by bastions of power for centuries? And you would be right, the regulation of grief practices has almost always occurred. There is great comfort in tradition, rules and practices at times of emotional instability. Offline though, that role has been occupied by governments, religions and communities who have played a role in defining grief etiquette. From what you should wear in the, in the mourning process, to how long you should mourn for, to what the appropriate grieving response is. But critically, there is freedom of choice offline. To express grief, you can turn to rituals and rules presented by these organisations, or you can express something organic. You have religious choice, and you can express within your immediate family or attend a community event. And critically, how long you grieve for can be a personal choice or a following a protocol. But the online world is looking very different. Let's take Facebook as an example. Last year, Facebook hit 2.2 billion monthly active users. Its worldwide adoption has become larger than any religious institution. This is influential because if, as we outlined earlier, the affordances of Facebook have an effect on how we can conduct ourselves online, and Facebook is motivated to ensure that we do conduct ourselves online, then Facebook is rapidly becoming an authority of immense scale and influence over our grieving practices. To be explicit, in the offline world, 7 billion people are scattered across 195 countries and 270 religions, experiencing and partaking in a diversity and multiplicity of grieving practices. In the online world, three companies, two of which are owned by the same corporation, have the power to influence 2.2 billion people's expression of grief. So if social media companies have the ability and the motivation to drive digital social norms when it comes to the expression of grief online, what impact is this having on our collective grief practices? Well, namely, if you want to express your grief online, you have to play by their rules. And thanks to network effects and affordances, there is little diversity of choice in the manifests of that expression. This is concerning and also worrying for a multitude of reasons. We're not only promoting a westernization of the way that grief has to work, but, a, but the westernization of Facebook, Twitter and Instagram viewing that way that grief has to work. And we are all unconsciously complicit. Let's start with time. Many religions and communities put strong emphasis on how long one should grieve for in the wake of a loss. Islam, for example, requires a specific mourning period. Family and friends of the deceased mourn for three days, widows mourn for four lunar months and 10 days. Hindus, on the other hand, limit the mourning period to 13 days. It's thought that if someone laments too much, then it will be harmful to the soul of the deceased. In the wake of the Paris attacks, Facebook released the ability to change your profile filter to a French flag as an expression of grief for the events that had happened. Facebook's morning time, blocks of one hour, one day, one week, or never, creating the expectation that any morning for a period greater or more nuanced than that would be wrong. Let's consider response next. Not to pick on Facebook, although I wouldn't be alone in recent efforts to do that, but for the sake of illustration, let's consider that these three features which Facebook has designed in explicit response to terror attacks. That is to say that people are utilizing platforms in the wake of tragedy to such an extent that Facebook has considered it appropriate to develop features to create those experiences. The Paris terror attacks marked the release of Facebook's safety check-in for, for the first human main tragedy. It was met with considerable applause but also scepticism, and its use continued to be rolled out as we map each new tragedy. But with each rollout, the persuasion and encouragement to engage with it became more and more aggressive, with clever behavioural cues such as tell your friends you are safe, and highlighting that others have done it too. Increasingly for many, it became less a humanitarian tool and more a way for Facebook to drive more engagement, which ultimately benefits Facebook's bottom line. But it's not just the makers who are looking to not let good tragedy go to waste. Recently, tragedies have seen celebrities quick to capitalise on an opportunity for potential profits. 50 Cent here posted his condolences swiftly, accompanied by a series of hashtags advertising new products. Despite deemed distasteful, distasteful by most, it highlights the powerful role of the attention economy. Not all tragedies are graced with these increasing grief norms. In allowing social media platforms to create our norms and facilitate their practice through the release of certain features, we also allow them to tell us which tragedies matter and which don't. These platforms may look and feel like public spaces, but they are owned by corporations, and with that lack of neutrality comes the ability to determine which lives are worthy of our grief. 
Two days before the Paris attack, suicide bombers raged war in Beirut. The spectacle was left out of Western media. There was no hashtag pray for Beirut, no sharing of iconography, and Facebook did not deploy the safety check-in. Here, Facebook chose not to recognize these deaths and drive digital grief norms, and so, in turn, we did the same. Three years later, on the 14th of February 2018, the news broke of another school shooting. This tragedy did seize media attention for weeks. But Facebook, reluctant to get into the political background of gun control, did not populate its crisis hub with the event. Instead, it chose to populate its safety check-in with natural disasters, wildfires, and cy cyclones. It's not just the platforms who make indiscriminate choices about what grief to recognize. We too have become conditioned to respond instantaneously regardless of context or confirmation of fact. For example, some of you in Europe and possibly in the States may have caught this news story. A couple of Saturdays ago, a truck drove down a quiet street in Munster, Germany into a group of diners enjoying food outside. Two people were killed and many were injured. Despite no statement from the authorities of the attack being terrorist in nature, the social media reaction was instantaneous. With immediate deployment of all the hallmarks of the new grief norms of social media, iconography, hashtag pray for, and the Facebook safety check-in. The attacker has since been identified as a German national with mental health issues and no affiliation to any terrorist group. The automatic deployment of such a behavior is worrisome and not unique. There are countless examples. One simply has to look at the recent stampede that occurred in Oxford Circus over nothing and the flood of social media messages that followed. Cass's cogs too were kicked to kick, quick to kick into gear as well with the release of this post. These automatic curated responses by the public suggest how deeply conditioned many of us have come in the wake of terrorism to express our grief online. Visibility of our grief may give us comfort and attention, but it doesn't always give us what we need. That is someone addressing our grief. Freud coined the phrase, the work of grief, and ever since there has lingered an idea that mourning is homework to do before we move on. But I leave you with the question, what if that work is no longer a personal pursuit, but emotional, but emotional work that is in the benefit of the new institutions that are masters of our digital world? And that work has to be done in a certain way, in a certain style, and only for a certain time. And last but not least, Tim Cowley-Shaw is a researcher at the BBC looking at the social role and impact of the technology that we design and build. I was a little worried about this talk because it's, uh, it's a good deal more lighthearted than a lot of the quite serious stuff we've been discussing. But um, I'm really glad that Amber brought up uh, this idea of um, digital platforms as public spaces or as sort of pseudo-public spaces, I guess is how you describe them. They're kind of private, um, uh, private kind of areas for discourse that kind of have don't necessarily have the hallmarks of publicness that are kind of um, uh, kind of kind of exist in this weird zone where we use them as zones of discourse but they have a bunch of kind of weird affordances that mean they don't actually work like public spaces because this is exactly the kind of thing I want to talk about and I'd like to talk about it through the lens of uh, these guys who are the Situationist International or three of the Situationist International who were a revolutionary organization active from the late 50s till the early 70s um, they had a really interesting kind of philosophy which incorporated kind of bits of anarchism bits of Marxism and bits of kind of Dada and surrealism as well um, so they were a fun bunch of people um, their kind of school of thought was at the centre of the May 1968 uprisings in Paris, which had been described as a revolt against modern consumer and technical society. Um, so the key thing there is it wasn't kind of, in contrast to stuff going on around the Vietnam War in the US and stuff going on in, say, Prague about um, the USSR, it wasn't necessarily a protest for any kind of one, one single outcome or against one single thing. It was sort of against this idea of authority and the status quo in general. It was a kind of just a general expression of frustration. Um, so it was as much a protest against boredom and malaise in general than any specific cause of it. Um, so the Situationist International were partly a school of political thought, um, I'm talking really fast, sorry, um, partly an artistic movement and partly a roving gang of pranksters and troublemakers, but it's very difficult to separate out all these aspects. Um, they were all of them simultaneously, and that's, I think, what makes them so interesting and I think relevant to us today. Um, so central to a lot of Situationist thought was uh, the work of this guy on the left, Guy Debord, who I'm going to talk a lot about because I've, um, I'm basically making an analogy about specifically some of his writing. Uh, so we're going to look at his work in more detail. Um, so this is a quote from the report on the construction of situations, which was published um, 11 years before 68, so in 57. Um, so he talks about changing the world and uh, the life in which we are confined and all these kind of big, grand, but quite general statements. Um, but um, 
most tellingly, he talks about this kind of most liberatory possible change. Um, so the goals of the movement were kind of maximum liberation, the freedom to exercise one's own agency and individuality. But I think this is, it's kind of, there's some subtlety here that makes it kind of more interesting than this sort of, like, purely kind of libertarian thing. Um, so... Uh, they were also a movement that was pro um, pro technology and pro progress. It wasn't this kind of this kind of modern luddism. They weren't concerned with rolling back technical technological advances to a simpler time, but they were interested in the possibilities afforded by them. In particular, they kind of saw an absurdity in the way in which society remained kind of rigidly ordered in the face of rapid technological change. Um, so. Um, in the face of increasing technology-led productivity, they argued that human labor had become more and more trivial, but we continued to spend the vast majority of our time on it. Um, so they didn't just mean work in the kind of literal sense of waged work. However, they were very interested in um, the idea of leisure time as a form of work. Um, they saw um, kind of the kind of typical leisure activities of the day as a form of work whose task was to mask the creative, intellectual, and effective depletion of everyday life. So Debord gave the object of these leisure activities a name, he called it the spectacle. And in his writing, the spectacle is the process by which all that was once directly lived has become mere representation. And this is a thing we'll return to in a second. So his most famous work is this book, uh, The Society of the Spectacle. Um, it's a short book which sets out a bunch of ideas about this stuff. So he claimed that um, just as early industrial capitalism moved the focus of existence from being to having, post-industrial culture has moved that focus from having to appearing. Um, and further, that spectacle is the sun that never sets over the empire of modern passivity. So I think... Um, uh, Debord's critique of 1968 era leisure time is kind of still relevant today. So we're in a similar era of kind of rapid technological acceleration, and I um, I used this image to justify it. And after um, after Jacqueline's talk, I kind of feel like I'm getting into that kind of Bruce Springsteen thing again, um, which I didn't want to. I think the idea of um, the automation of effective labor is a really interesting thing, which will tie some stuff together later on. Um, we've got this kind of rapid technology-led productivity gains uh, without any kind of increase, increase in the exchange value of our own labor. So, the, the, um, in fact, the, the inverse is true. If you look at the kind of, I say, wages of people who are driving, uh, it's being eroded. People are spending more time working on tasks like driving while that job is being automated. We're in the same kind of situation of this sort of absurdity of technological progress. Um, this is, again, as Jackie pointed out, this kind of intersects with um, other forms of oppression as well. If it's effective labor that's being disproportionately automated, that intersects with, um, with gender, with a bunch of other things. Um, there's a kind of absurdity in the way, um, the way automation is affecting our working lives. So other themes, passivity, our leisure activities are becoming more passive. This idea of kind of scrolling through these infinite timelines of banalities, and I don't mean my two friends in particular here, it's just that I'm, they just happen to be the people who were up there when I took the screenshot, so sorry. Um, and finally, a focus on appear, uh, appearance over substance. Um, these are, like looking at, say, the kind of culture of social media influences, there's this idea of leisure time being commodified. You can, um, the kind of culture of... Um, Doing doing things in order to photograph them, in order to gain influence through them, rather than experiencing them, living them directly. This is all kind of kind of spectacular ideas. So one example I like in particular is the Snapchat filter. Uh, Snapchat filters are such a, such a kind of spectacular thing. They're completely passive. They've got no um, no real affordances beyond just applying them or not applying them. There's no kind of generativity in what you can do with them. Um, there's this constrained set of possibilities. Uh, they're often branded or sponsored by a UK soap brand here. I don't know if you have that here, over here. And you're using them to create the appearance of a completely non-existent situation. So Snapchat filters are pure spectacle as far as I'm concerned. So what does this teach us beyond the fact that um, the struggle continues, uh, as it says on that poster up there? Um, I think we can learn, uh, if we, we can look at the kind of malaise that the situation has identified, but we can also look at the way they chose to re respond to it. And I think that leads to some other kind of interesting correspondences uh, with things going on today. So a big um, part of the kind of situationist strategy for rebellion was what they called the constructed situation. It was a deliberate, participative, and playful intervention intended to highlight the spectacular qualities of the world around us. They are deliberate, they are playful, they are participatory, and they subvert and critique both the culture and the infrastructure of the world around them. This is where we get back to this idea of public space um, and the idea of how kind of affordances and how um, infrastructure shapes how space is used. So. Which slide am I on? I'm really sorry. There we are. Okay. So there are very specific reclaiming of culture by putting it to... Um, 
by putting it to rebellious use. It's reclaiming the, the space and culture for rebellion. I'd like to suggest that just as with the spectacle, the construction of situations also has several useful online analogues. So memes, they're, kind of, they're participatory, they're an expression of kind of joy and fun, and they reclaim the spectacular infrastructure of social media and the spectacular content of pop culture for rebellious ends. So this is from an account called Goth Shakira, which is an amazing um, feminist uh, Instagram account. Um, and like, if you look at the other uses Instagram's put, put to, if you look at other stuff like this, this is kind of a rebellious thing to be doing with the uh, this kind of infrastructure that's been designed for, for commerce and for, um, for passivity. Um, another one, I have to thank um, Max Sakelik uh, from yesterday in the MapQuest uh, <laughs> talk. GPS doodles are another kind of constructed situation because they're, again, subverting the kind of infrastructure of surveillance. If you were at the MapQuest talk yesterday, there was some really interesting stuff about the um, the kind of consequences of this sort of measurement of people's activity and deliberately going around and doing something silly with it. Oh, sorry. Um, how long have I got? Sorry, I didn't. I haven't been looking. Oh, okay, right. I'll be very quick. Um, so this um, it subverts the ability to, for our kind of everyday action to be monitored in a way that's just kind of through just being silly, basically. Like it's. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, another one I picked up while I was here. This is Rupert v um, Vasudevan's project called Bellwether, which he did during the um, election, which kind of harvested a bunch of political speech online and used it to subvert the um, the kind of aesthetics and the grammar of political campaigning, and also the kind of the platforms of digital discourse by taking uh, taking digital discourse and recontextualizing it elsewhere. Um, I have two more examples for you, then I'll wrap up. So this one is a little bit of a kind of weird Facebook deep cut. This is something called Business Group, um, which I was introduced to by a friend. And it's essentially a, it's a kind of bit of absurdist performance art that people are doing for its own sake. It's a, um, it's a, like on the surface of it, it's a business networking group, but made up of people who are completely not involved in this and it's got this really specific kind of grammar of action and way of interacting which is like this game that evolves as people are part of it and again i think this is such an interesting thing because it's taking the grammar of action the affordances of facebook and putting it to and highlighting the absurdity of it um I'll spend some time with this because i could go on about it for another 12 minutes on its own it's really really interesting um so finally the use of bots this is using the, the infrastructure of the internet itself using code to subvert the kind of platforms they're a part of so this one recontextualizes speech online it finds anything with a pattern of syllables that sits in haiku form and then pulls it out and shows it um with a slight difference in formatting, just to kind of take the speech, take, um, take it out of context and show a different use of it. And it's this kind of playfulness that I think um, is really useful at kind of undermining a bunch of the, the expectations and a bunch of the kind of the ways in which these platforms format our, um, our actions and our interactions with each other. So I guess what's the point of all this? Um, for me, I guess the important thing is for, for Debord, situations were joyful. They're an attack on misery. And this is the key point. Um, the spectacular qualities of the online world we saw earlier are a pretty dark, pretty frightening thing. And the fact that we've got this kind of this opportunity for collectful, collective and joyful human creativity to remake the, inf this sort of, the infrastructure of these platforms we're using is a really important thing and is an explicitly an act of resistance. Um, and it's something which should be, should be defended. I've got an important caveat here I think I need to, I think I need to make. So, these techniques I've described are kind of used by what I would what I would describe as kind of reactionary fascist, fascist forces, and I don't think anyone here would necessarily disagree as well. So, does our comparison fall down here? Can we talk about um, can we talk about these kind of techniques in a way that we can kind of celebrate their value as resistance without kind of giving credence to a bunch of a bunch of reactionary stuff that's using similar things? And I think we can by going back to situationist thought. So. Um, the situation is recognized that there's a process by which these kind of subversive actions get um, incorporated back into spectacular culture. And I think that's what we're seeing with things like kind of Pepe the Frog and all this kind of stuff. Um, to expand on that a bit further, let's go back to that first quote we looked at. Um, uh, the main thing here is that um, revolutionary actions enlarge life rather than just seeking to explain it or to express the order of life as it currently is. They're by definition kind of emancipatory or liberating. So. Uh, this is this is kind of to expand on that. This is the kind of key thing to be um, 
to be kind of truly kind of liberating and revolutionary, they need to present an alternative to kind of the, he the hegemonic culture that goes on. Um, and this goes hand in hand to me with kind of ideas of social justice and ideas of kind of ideas of intersectionality. For an online action to be a situationist intervention, it must be emancipatory. It must be liberating. Uh, liberating. So this brings me to my main point. Um, joy, play, freedom, and creativity um, are, by definition, kind of kind of revolutionary affordances. They're, they're kind of, they're important things for us to kind of be emancipated within digital platforms. And this is a thing that should be celebrated and defended. Uh, this is where it come back to Amber's work. I think this is where stuff like the kind of French flag thing that is a very limited affordance is a kind of, it's kind of a danger because it removes that ability for us to be creative and to be playful in these spaces. It makes them kind of formatted very rigorously. And there's, um, there's other, sorry. Oh, down to zero. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's basically Sorry, it. Sorry. <laughs> and that's about it. Thank you very much. Um, okay, great. Thanks, guys. That was a really uh, fascinating variety of topics that I thought had some really interesting dovetails while also covering a lot of ground. Um, one thing, I noticed Whitney tweeted that, um, Amber, on your slide of the, let's see, 2.2 billion Facebook users, 2.1 billion Christians, what was the last icon? Uh, atheism. Atheism, yeah. okay, so there we go. Question answered, look, we're off to a great start. <laughs> um, so the, uh, Tim's talk had some really interesting ideas on how to move, carry some of these critiques forward, and I'm wondering if any of the uh, first three speakers have thoughts on on whether um, that idea can be applied to some of the critiques you made to to bring those forward and share them or move beyond them. Okay, so the question is. Um in Tim's talk, talking about Dadaism as a mode of critique, if any of the other three panelists have any thoughts along those lines. Um. I actually don't have anything formulated, but um, I, I think that uh, this reading through the uh, sort of Situationist International applies more to uh, public forums, public fora, like uh, social networks, which the other presenters talked about more than I did. Um, I don't know, I guess, I guess I have, I have, I have questions also about sort of the, the derive um, concept uh, online because I, 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 I feel that it's often so much about sort of the body and the city, the psychogeography and sort of, um, and, and so there are questions about who's comfortable in different parts of the city and who and and sort of is is there a kind of transcendence of the body where you're only observing in the city or but I think um let's see so applying it to bots um I'm not totally sure I mean I think I think we're but I, it's certain that we're living in a society of the spectacle um I wonder maybe you have some thoughts um I think sorry I lingered on it a bit but one of the most shocking things to me about what happens online after terrorist attacks is the uniformity, um, regardless of your location and your geography. So that's really unusual because we are all culturally very different and people often turn to people they respect or their peers or their families in moments of crisis and in often religions and governments. And we seem to be abandoning that a little bit and turning more to that attention reward online of knowing what will get our post visibility. And I mean, I did it. <laughs> so that is what triggered me to do this. It was kind of a reflection on my own actions, which was so abnormal to how I normally conduct myself on social media. And then to see it happen over and over again. And I do focus only on Europe, but um, that's mainly because I'm situated in Europe. I've seen the same behavior across America. I'm also in East Asia as well, which are often less publicized in Western media. So there's a real turning away from religion and governments that are, are so have such hold over our, our other elements of life. And this desire to post in a way that is a spectacle, in a way that is guaranteeing a certain response. Yeah, I'm thinking more of maybe in a slightly different direction, the banality of these platforms like Instagram and their banal potential and how the internet in a way, um, especially stemming back from data and its relationship to situationism, really um, 
kind of poses itself as a ready-made of some sort for artists to adopt and to incorporate into their art practices. And you find a lot now that a lot of net artists and contemporary artists in general really um, kind of perform on these platforms and they they adopt a certain personalities like Cindy Sherman, for instance, who's very famous, uses her Instagram in a very specific way. Um, she's adopted these very, you know, it's not professional. She's kind of using it for fun, but it's also her art practice, too. And there are a lot of artists that also use um, YouTube to perform on, too. And it kind of takes a while for everyone else to get in on the joke. But I think that's kind of how it relates to memes and meme culture and all of this. Yeah, right up front. Uh, so, Amber, I had a question for you. I wonder if you have explored any connections between the commodification of grief online and virtue signaling as a practice vis-a-vis uh, -vis post reposting or making visible one's positions on particular instances of tragedy. Mm -hmm. So the question was, um, what is the relationship between the homogenous posting online versus virtue signaling, which, for those who aren't, familiar it's it's a way of expressing yourself online that you know is aspiring to be like a good person or doing something that um, society rewards um, but it's constructed so it's actually almost meaningless because you're just performing it um, I actually started on that tangent and I looked a lot into virtue signaling and it's a term that's become really popular in the last two years it, it got sort of coined and escalated very quickly and is often misappropriated um, it's a really tough tension to explore because you're dealing with quite a sensitive topic where I think we heard yesterday from Crystal as well that it's a duplicity, right? Even if they are virtue signaling, there's probably a degree of to them that also does experience that. Um, and they do relate to what's being posted. Um, so in the retweeting or in the resharing of iconography, which a designer has purposefully designed to be catching in that moment and easily spread, should you tear people down for virtue signaling? I w would rather be more comfortable, and maybe that's an easy escape, apportioning it to the platforms and their creation of affordances that reward that style of behavior. I don't think it is so much an individual choice anymore, and I don't think people are, it's such an instantaneous action that I don't think people are as, as careful to construct in that moment as they may be in other certain circumstances. So I think, yeah, that was a very long-winded way of saying no. I don't think that on the whole they are virtue signaling. There will be, of course, one or two who probably are. Um, but my concern more is that the, the platform creates circumstances where that behavior is rewarded. Um, I'm also thinking, though, in the way that religious grief is a performance in itself, and that um, the comparison you did to that was, it was really good just to kind of see which had a certain uh, duration and what you were supposed to do, the public nature of, of that, um, that religious grief. Um, and so it seems like it's, it's not necessarily a, a, an even split between uh, what you're doing online, right, is, is kind of this performative, kind of, uh, kind of a consumerized uh, performance versus maybe what uh, religious leaders did in the past. So maybe could you say that what we're seeing is also um, it has the implicit structures of traditional religions now being kind of built into this institutional framework that perhaps we could call uh, religious framework. I believe what you're saying is that we're seeing it's not so much that we've abandoned the, the history of our expression of offline grief and the certainly the ritualization. And ritualization is a term that I will be bringing into my written work rather than the presentation here, because it's quite a loaded term. Um, and more that now online, we have new rituals that have the hallmarks of old institutions. Um, hopefully I didn't just no, I thought that was really well, that was destroy that. <laughs> um, I completely agree with you. Um, again, my concern more is the absence of choice and it becomes a very binary scenario, whereas offline, the the public spaces, the style, the way you negotiate grief after a mass tragedy, it has, um, there are rules and protocols decided by institutions, but your buy into that is, is a personal choice. And there's very little judgment in the public space of that action. Um, online, I think the game slightly changed. If you do want to express something online, which most of us are conditioned to want to do, um, slash pressured by others to do something, you have to do it along the mannerisms 
um, that are being suggested by the platform through affordances and also what you're seeing other people do. And those are very homogenous rules and regulations. That's not to say that you couldn't just deviate, but we're so conditioned to want to and crave that attention and that recognition for grief that it almost feels like a non-choice. It's like a non-entity to position your grief in a personal way. And I should caveat at this point that there is a reason that I'm studying mass tragedy rather than personal individual grief in response to personal tragedy like a loss of a family member even a loss of a pet because those are individualized emotions and they have been studied quite heavily in this area i'm, I'm more interested in even celebrities and the and the mass style of tragedy and the way that we respond there um uh this is a question for jackie uh the idea of like uniformity and homogeneity has come up a lot um and uh, a lot of conversations about AI have talked about like algorithmically reinforced homogeneity, uh, and I was reading about how Amazon is kind of trying to roll out this like uh, Echo that's specifically designed for kids, and I was reading about how they have like a specifically different script that's more tailored to like what uh, kids would respond better to, and this seems like a very specific like design intervention uh, against the idea of uniformity. So I was wondering if that's something you've like encountered in your work, and also like how the kind of AI apparatus of like technical systems and also the like labor of people who train the AI kind of have to contend with this idea of like difference between the people who use uh, bots. Do you want to take stabs? Oh sure. Um, I'm really interested by this question. It's about homogeneity in the design of um, AI assistants and in, in, in uh, homogeneity in sort of like. Um, the the way these designs respond or do not respond to the diversity of users and uh, specifically about how Alexis designers have recently rolled out a version of the Echo that is like for kids, um, which is the first I've heard of it, so I'm very interested, thank you. Um, I, my mind immediately goes to these kinds of like, um, I mean, we think a lot about sort of, um, I think a lot about abuse and virtual assistants, and there have been a few sort of like embarrassing, I think, uh, like YouTube videos or articles about how kids can just sort of like really like insult uh, Alexa, and it's it's and it's sort of this idea of reinforcing um, that kind of behavior. I would be very curious to know whether this Alexa for kids like tells them like you don't you know, wash your mouth out with soap, don't speak to me that way, you know, like, I, I don't, I'm very curious to, to know, like, what it's responding to, um, because, yeah, there also have been reports that kids really love Alexa, and which is kind of alarming, but maybe not so surprising. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I mean, yeah, I think this this comes up a lot. Um, I, I think that, uh, like, customizing bots for different users is a really interesting question. I don't know how, how often it, it actually happens practically, um, but in theory, I think it would engage some of the kinds of questions we have about um, sort of intelligent systems, like the Facebook news feed that are customized for each user, and what's kind of the data harvested in order to make that super personalized experience that you love. Um, that's sort of where my mind goes, but I'm, I'm very interested, thank you. Hi. Um, this is my last question. My question is for Jacqueline as well. It's more about, so we're speaking about effective labor in AI. My interest, my question for you is what are your thoughts on how there's, there are now being developed uh, sexual companion AIs that are in tandem with the really, really, like rapidly accelerating uh, sexual robots now in the wake of like especially now with the incel community being more brought to light and the fact that sexual technology is like going to be developed at a faster pace than anything else what are your thoughts on how that would affect the labor of women paid and unpaid in our society as this is being outsourced to robots you can really dehumanize yeah thank you so much and um, I think that there are a lot of um concerns around this. I mean, in my talk, I spoke about how AI may be counterintuitively, given our myths about Bruce Springsteen, or, you know, Detroit, whatever, is actually coming for women and for women's jobs, and maybe this is another example. Um, I, let's see, I, I don't know how good these, uh, 
these like sex robots are that we that we like call them robots and not dolls that's maybe kind of beside the point um but um I don't know the the uh, the sociologist Catherine Cross has said some really has written very interestingly published a couple of years ago about um the idea that uh abuse or behavior toward these bots that are feminized reveals how users would like to treat women were no one watching, which to me is very compelling. But at the same time, I also wonder whether users treat bots or, or uh, women, feminized robots this way uh, because they understand they're robots and not women, not only because they're like, tr they, they, they fear retaliation uh, for treating women this way. Um, I don't know, I mean, maybe like, it, it doesn't, I mean, so I, I really like love, like my friends have made jokes about like, okay, so like this like solves the problem of the incels. They can just sort of like have a sex doll and they can like stop bothering us. But I, I don't think it actually solves the problem, but I think I'm very compelled by this. By this, It's kind of a joke also. Um, those are sort of uh, some of my initial thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so my question is mainly to Tim, but everyone else, if you have a full time, would be uh, great as well. So in, in the last six, uh, 40 or 50 years, states have become kind of a, a in, especially in Europe particularly, kind of like had a progressive effect on regulating some of the public spaces, whether it being media or political parties and so on, to liberate them and open them up to the people who've been uh, fed in the margins. Uh, and in a lot of discussions that it talks about uh, the, uh, the right to dissent in online public spaces being the, the platforms or so on, um, the conversation about role of state, the role of government or democratic institutions as enforcer of values on these platforms is completely absent. All the conversations is about what we can do as users, whether individuals or in, in like subculture groups, to use them better for dissent or uh, for uh, subversive behaviors. I was wondering whether that is because you think there's a generational gap in terms of viewing the state as a legitimate force of bringing progressive change or is it because that we see this corporation so much above law that we don't we don't even imagine a, a, a democratic institution intervening and asking to do something against the shareholders interest wow um, I'll try and paraphrase that yeah um, I'm I'll try and paraphrase that. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer it. So the question was about um, the role of the state in kind of upholding the norms of public space and whether there is um, a role for, like, stop me if I'm going completely off, off track here, a role for kind of regulation in enforcing the kind of, enforcing or upholding the kind of, the norms and the expectations we have of public space online. Um, okay, I'll get that as a, <laughs> good. Um, I don't know if I can answer this. I think, um, so, I mean, you can tell, given the kind of paucity of sources I use, that my, I've got quite a narrow reading on this. And I think there's, um, I've definitely come from a kind of, perhaps the slightly anarchist tradition from people like Henri Lefebvre, from David Harvey, people like this, who tend to kind of, tend to talk more about kind of collective agency than about kind of, you know, organizations and states and governments. Um, what interests me is, I guess, what what that regulation would look like. So. There, oh, so this is a very long way of saying I've absolutely no idea. I can't answer this, but it's I don't know how you would regulate to sort of uphold uh, this this kind of capacity for generative action and this capacity for surprise. I don't know. I I, I really don't know how that could be codified. But um, I don't think this is. I, mean, I don't want to kind of do down the role of regulation in general because I think this is. You know, there's a bunch of other kind of not entirely orthogonal problems that could be dealt with with regulation, especially around kind of uh, measurement and algorithmics and a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, how, what regulation would do, particularly, I mean, I think, so I think Amber's, uh, Amber's work is one of the, a really good example of the type of thing I'm kind of concerned about. And I, don't, I can't see personally how laws or regulation could intervene to, to help in that situation. And I don't know, I guess, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, because yeah, as a, as a minor segue, I think one of the interesting things that I've come across in my work is the uptake by heads of states and by celebrities and by global leaders of the same behavior. So where previously, um, if there was such a big threat to cultural norms and cultural practices, heads of states would probably be slightly concerned and be in rejection of it or at least in direct criticism of it. A lot of the work that I have done 
as we've moved through each terror event, um, which are sadly of great frequency, has seen an increasing pressure for heads of states to adopt exactly the same response. And if they don't, they get a lot of kickback. Um, so they too are sharing the same hashtags and they too are using very similar terminology. And I did, I did a kind of segue piece of work where um, I looked into whether um, social media was democratizing the, the nature of voices that were being reported on in, in print media um, as we moved more towards social media as a society. And I did find that previously we would have taken statements from heads of states um, in the past, in 2005 and 2001, um, after 9-11 and 7-7, um, we, did, we didn't see such duplicity of voices coming out from just like the victims' families or members of the public who were bad witness to the events, whereas social media has increased that, but it hasn't quietened the voices of heads of states either. It's instead created this perverse pressure where they too must oblige with this homogeneity, which is particularly interesting, I think, in light of what you were discussing. I think that's as good a place as any to um, to let it go. Yeah, I, I thank you so much, everybody, for coming and for all your wonderful questions to our panelists for a really great set of presentations. Um, yeah, thanks. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>